one of the things, or the three things that we always, always focus on and, uh, in our webinars is the human body, first and foremost, how our cells work, how our systems work, and what they need to keep on functioning. And that's number two, excuse me. So the first part is, is, is how the different systems in our bodies work, the different cells in our bodies work. Number two, what our bodies need to function at their best, and of course that includes nutrition and other things. Number three, uh, of course, the threats to our health. Now here's the thing, uh, as we grow older, it, it becomes of even greater importance for us to understand these things because as we're growing, as we're, when we're young, we're, 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 we have a lot more reserves, in other words. But as we grow older, we need to understand these things more and more, and that's really why we're having Dr. Uh, Dr. Marvin teach about this. Uh, this uh, he's he's all he's a, a senior himself and has studied this. Really, uh, Sherry's going to introduce him in a minute. But Dr. Marvin has done everything from deliver babies in his 50-year career. Everything from deliver babies to take care of the the, the aging. He, he is uh, an expert. Has also been involved in geriatric care. So we are really, really honored and privileged to have someone of his wisdom and his experience and expertise to talk to us on this subject. And I'll just give, hand it over to Sherry to go ahead and introduce him. Okay, just one moment. I'm, I'm trying to make Dr. Marvin the presenter, and it's, um, it's trying to make me the presenter, so I apologize just one moment. Okay. There we go. The joys of technology. <coughs> okay. Um, let's, yes, I would love to introduce Dr. Marvin to you. Um, Dr. Marvin received a degree in pharmacy and a doctor of medicine from the University of Kansas. And like David said, he has been practicing medicine for over 50 years. He now speaks for many groups regarding the fields of health and nutrition. He spends much of his time studying the newest literature in the field of health and longevity, which he's going to speak to us tonight about. And because of his medical background and his many years as practicing as a family physician, he has found this ability to interpret all of that scientific material and communicate it to people in a way that it can be clearly understood by the average person. And that is a great asset that Dr. Marvin brings to all of his presentations. And with this in mind, and still employing his many years of experience as a family physician, he has set a new goal for himself of educating and sharing information with as many people as possible in an effort to help them improve the length and quality of their life. And just with my personal interactions with Dr. Marvin, he is a wonderful person, and he's got a great sense of humor. He's full <laughs> of wisdom, and we are just so excited to have him here tonight. So, Dr. Marvin, are you there? And are you? Ready? I am here. Okay, here we go. Okay. Good evening, friends, truth seekers, fun lovers, and anybody else that's listening. Uh, I'm going to share tonight my favorite subject, the quest for longevity. And uh, I'm going to explain about what I uh, have found. So, if I can, there. Longevity, first with some definitions. Whenever we talk about anything, we've got to know what we're talking about. So, let's have some definitions. The average lifespan or life expectancy, you hear a lot about that, it's simply the average age at which 50% of a given population have died. That's the average life expectancy. The maximum lifespan, or we can many times just refer to it as lifespan, this is the upper limit of age that is unlikely to be surpassed. Now, I want to explain Genetically, and I've spent a lot of time studying genetics, made a DVD on genetics. The uh, genetic lifespan of the mammal 
of humans is 120 to 150 years. I have in my possession here, within reach of my hand, a picture of a 130-year-old woman who's spry and healthy at that age. So we haven't surpassed that here in the United States, but a few people have now. That's the maximum lifespan. Longevity itself is how close you get to the maximum lifespan before you die. Now, I, I've got this photograph on this next slide, and it's wonderful how well preserved it is because it dates back to where we were living out in the wilderness, and the colors haven't faded at all. And it shows these people out collecting the greens and the roots and the nuts and all the herbs, and uh, that's what the little picture demonstrates. We call these hunter-gatherers. They spent from 14 to 16 hours a day collecting their food. That was their main occupation. They didn't have to buy a new uh, LCD TV or the latest car. They had to get food to eat, and they had to hunt it and gather it. And the only meat they could eat was what they either outrun, which wasn't a lot, I'm sure, and now I don't know about a dinosaur. That would be a feast for several years, but I don't know where they could kill a thing once they caught it. Anyhow, their average lifespan hundreds of years ago when they were in this situation was approximately 18 years. Now we know they had to live at least 17 or 18 years because had they died sooner, they would not have been able to propagate the race and we all wouldn't have been here. Now, if your lifespan is approximately 18 years, that means that there's a tremendous amount of death at birth. And that was their problem. They didn't have midwives, they didn't have physicians then to help birthing. The birthing just happened between mothers and grandmothers helping daughters give birth. So that was the plight of the hunter-gatherers. Their lifespan was approximately 18 years. Now, the maximum lifespan for humans as we know it, appears to be 120 years. And this figure hasn't changed for centuries, except we're finding now there is a few isolated people that have, you know, lived longer than that, have exceeded that 120-year span. Our goal in this presentation in the pursuit of longevity is to put more life into your years than years into your life. When I was in active practice here, I took care of 12 nursing homes, which were more or less storage facilities for people that their families weren't taking care of. I'm not criticizing the families. I know there's many accentuating circumstances. But so many of these people had life in their years, but no years in their life. You know what they mean? They had no life in their years. They weren't energetic. They weren't enjoying life. They were sitting around every day waiting for be put to bed at night and fed a couple times in between. Not looking at that, I want to put more life in your years than years in your life. So that's what I've spent all this time researching. Starting at the cellular level, in 1961, Leonard Hayflick and Paul Moorhead, two researchers, demonstrated that all normal cells have a fixed limit on the number of times they can divide in order to replace themselves. Every cell in your body has to replace itself. All of them replace themselves at a different speed. Bone replaces itself about every two years. Skin, as you know, when you brush your skin at night before you get, take a shower or in the morning before you take a shower, little flecks come off. Well, that's dead skin and new skin has to replace it or we'd all be running around sopping, bleeding areas in our body. So. We have to replace those cells. The number of times that your cells can replace themselves is known as the Hayflick limit. The Hayflick limit varies from species to species. Okay, let's look at some of those. The humans have a Hayflick number of 50 cell divisions. That's the longest lived mammals. And that is the longest by cell physiology, 
Okay. Now, what does that mean? Mice, which live about three years, have a hayflick number of 15 divisions. Chickens with an average lifespan of 12 years have a number of 25. Now, that was an exception when I was raised on the farm, because if they were uh, young friars, they didn't last 12 years. They went in the skillet. But I'm talking about chickens just left alone to live on the farm will live about 12 years. They have a hayflick number of 25. Now, at the extreme longevity is Galapagos tortoise, which can live 175 years. And he doesn't look very happy, as you see there in that picture. But he has a hayflick number of 110. Now, what determines how many times cells of different organisms can divide? That's an easy answer, but a very difficult process. The answer is encoded in the organism's DNA. Now, before you is a picture of the helix. Now, let me tell you how complicated that helix is. We have 100 trillion cells in our body. The latest assessment is there are 100 trillion. And each one of the mitochondria at the nucleus has these, uh, what you see before you in the nucleus. And that determines every bit of our inheritance in that DNA. In fact, there's only two people that have ever had their entire helix read. It costs about $70 million presently to totally read your helix, every chromosome in your body, to read all the DNA identification, about $70 million. Now, one of them was the two men that described the helix and uh, watch and, and flick. Anyhow, Crick, I mean, Watson and Crick. Now, to go ahead, there's a helix. And for your cells to divide and to reproduce and make more tissue, chromosomes have to replicate themselves. They replicate it by uncoiling the chromosomes so that their genetic code can be copied to make duplicate strands. One of the things that chromosomes can do is to copy DNA. And you see, if you would have a hundred kids, you wouldn't have anybody exactly the same because the, the mix of DNA is always going to be different unless they're both from the same fertilized egg or two separate eggs fertilized. But they're not going to be identical, two separate eggs. It has to be one egg. Okay. Now, they replicate by uncoiling the chromosomes that their genetic code can be copied to make duplicate strands. Each time this process occurs, something is lost. A little piece of the end of each of these strands drops off. That's called the telomere. At the Hayflick limit, the length of the remaining telomere is insufficient to allow further duplication of DNA strands to occur without resulting in serious genetic mishaps. That's why when a person is older and happens to have a baby, the incidence of genetic abnormalities skyrocket because of the weakening of the DNA. We don't need to go in that tonight. But anyhow, this is what happens. If you would take the helix in every one of, or just one of your cells, that helix stretched out would equal the diameter of the Earth about 24,000 miles. So you can see how complicated that string of DNA is. There is no more cell division at the time when all of the telomeres have shortened themselves so there's no duplication. And with no cell division, there's no reproductive life. And instead, their senescence or senility of the cells develops and eventually cell death. Because we don't replace those cells, the ones that die are going to be the end of the story. Now. In 1985, Dr. Carol Greider and Elizabeth Blackburn reported the discovery of a telomerase. Now, this is a little enzyme that adds units to the telomeres. Well, that sounds wonderful because that will extend our living. If we can take this telomerase and have somehow apply it to our DNA, it makes up the normal loss during cell division or aging. Now, this is being used in genetic research massively all over the world. However, 
there is a downside. Research scientists believe this is one of the reasons why cancer cells can divide without limit. They have developed a way to turn on the genes in your DNA that produce telomerase. That's how cancer cells. So this is, makes this a very touchy research project because we have to make sure we don't make the telomerase that will turn cells into a, the malignant state. So that's kind of a complicated situation there. But research is going on, and research will eventually, I believe, come to some type of answer to that state. It may not be for everybody. It may be in certain diseases. It may be something first that they can turn telomerase off in cancer or malignant cells. We don't know. That's something they're working on. Now, I want to bring up something new. It's called the blue zones. What are some of the characteristics of blue zones, and what are blue zones? Blue zones are four areas, and now they think maybe in Greece they found the fifth blue zone, but it hasn't been publicized in detail. That's going to be in May. They're overdoing research in this area. And the four blue zones that consist, one is Sardinia, half of Italy, one is Okinawa in Japan, and one is Nicoya in Costa Rica. That's three of them. There's only one blue zone in the United States, and that is in Loma Linda, California. And we're going to talk about these more extensively. These are four blue zones where people live from three to five times longer than they live anywhere else in the world. Hmm. So the whole purpose in the quest for longevity, what do they do the rest of us don't? How do they live that we haven't aspired to? People live with many similarities in these areas to the Bible. A blue zone is a place in the world where higher percentage live astoundingly longer lives with vitality and happiness. These are people that, some of them, 110 years old, get up in the morning and split their own wood, and they garden after eating their breakfast, and they may herd sheep all day long. They may walk for six, eight miles that day. They're very happy. They're very peaceful, and they are living an abundant life. Residents of the Blue Zones are able to retain health and vitality well into their 80s, 90s, and 100s, and even older. One example is a 112-year-old whose best friend is her daughter, who lives with her. They are both spry, and the daughter is 91. The mother also has a son, Tommy, is his name. He rides his bicycle up a hill to see him every morning at 7 o'clock. He's 82. Now, these are people and their activities in the Blue Zones. And it looks like that bicycle he probably had when he was 15. <laughs> yeah. Any, now, where is this? The bicycle. I mean, wh which part of the, which blue zone is this? Which country is this? I don't know which one that is. That okay. one there is in, of course, Okinawa. Okay. But the other one with the bicycle. Oh, the one with the 112-year-old is in Okinawa. Okay. Okay. Now, let me get... There. An example of simple things that help in attaining longevity is drinking five eight-ounce glasses of good water a day. What do I mean by good water? Well, there's all grades of water, but at least reverse osmotic water. If you have a reversed osmotic filter, then you're going to get good water. Drinking five eight-ounce glasses of good water a day has been shown to decrease the risk of colon cancer by 45%, breast cancer by 79%, and bladder cancer by 50%. Now, that's going to be hard for most of you to believe, but that's been shown, and that's published. World health organizations predict that unless we change our eating habits and our nutrition and our lifestyle, by 2020, the cancer rate will increase by 50%. Now, just meditate on that. By 2020, the cancer rate will increase by 50%. The United States is now classified by World Health Organization, or WHO, as the 42nd healthiest nation in the world. 
In the B-42nd, we spent $2 trillion last year on health care. Actually, the new statistics are about $2.3 trillion. But what is that compared to the money we've been spending in the last six months? Peanuts. Okay, now to go on. The number one healthiest nation in the world is France. The number two healthiest nation in the world is Italy. Why on the world aren't we at $2.3 trillion a year for health care more than 42nd? From 41st upward to 1, no one spends a 20th of what we spend. That's just a little pearl for you to think of. Now, before you think, I wish I'd been born a Sardinian or a uh, Okinawan or a Nicaraguan and Costa Rican or been in Loma Linda, let me tell you something that you take home. 25% of our longevity is genetic. 75% of our longevity is lifestyle. What do we mean by lifestyle? How we eat, how our emotions affect us, how we relieve ourselves from stress, how we exercise, and how happy we are, and how tied to our families we are, and how tied to a religious lifestyle we are. Now that's all been shown by analyzing the lifestyles, and they've done this, they started eight years ago. National Geographic did, studying these four blue zones. What factors in our lifestyle add to our longevity? One, purpose. If you can tell me why you got up this morning, you will live seven years longer than the person who can't. You've got to have a purpose. The Bible says without a vision, the people perish. And that's exactly been proven by the study of these four blue zone areas. Two, universally in the blue zones, prayer is almost unanimous. It is estimated this adds three to four years to your life. Well, there you've got seven years and add, say, three to four years to your life. You're already up to 10 or 11 years more than you would otherwise. Gets interesting, doesn't it? Okay. Now, as in Bible times, these people eat very little meat. Archaeologists have determined that in biblical times, even working men in hard labor ate meat only once a week and then relatively small amounts. Now, sadly, we've got nothing but red meat on this picture. But most of these people don't eat red meat. Most of these people eat other forms of meat. Ideal this portion, regardless of which it is, would have been no larger than a deck of cards. Once a week, leading, eating meat no larger than a deck of cards. People that say, I can't live without meat, that is 100% psychological. <laughs> if it's worth dying for, continue. Okay? What are these blue zones? Well, in Sardinia, most of the centurions drink goat milk for breakfast walk six miles a day, love to work, and spend more of their day in the pastures. Some of them walk 16 to 20 miles a day. These are people over 90 and some over 100. Also, their sense of humor helps them shed stress, and their devotion to family provides invaluable support. I was telling funny things to some people one day, and they said, is that how you keep young? Well, I don't know, but it might be a thought. Uh, number two, in Okinawa, Although the people do suffer from disease, they experience them at a far lower rate than Americans. A fifth the rate of cardiovascular disease, and a fourth the rate of breast and prostate cancer, and a third the rate of dementia that we have here in the United States. Now get that. They experience them at far lower rates than Americans. And... A fifth the rate of cardiovascular disease, that's high blood pressure, stroke, and heart disease, heart attacks. A fourth the rate of breast and prostate cancer, which is an epidemic state here in the United States. And a third the rate of dementia. Now that's worth getting a little bit serious about, wouldn't you say? Yeah, okay. Costa Rican man, at age 60, has about twice the chance of reaching age 90 as does a man living in the United States. France, or even Japan, 
They believe in God, have a strong work ethic, and possess a zeal for their family. Their diets consist largely of corn, beans, some pork, garden veggies, and fruit. Interestingly, and like many places in Latin America, they have a more liberal, relaxed, and flexible attitude towards sex and marriage. That you'll have to go in and do research on another time. In Loma Linda, California, for the past half century, members of the Seventh-day Adventist community, the only blue zone in the United States, whose faith endorses healthy living, lead the nation in the longest life expectancy. Did you get what I said? For the last 50 years, they have lived 10 years on the average longer than everybody else in the United States. There's 9,000 Seventh-day Adventists, roughly, I've been told, in Loma Linda. They have their own grocery store. One thing they eat a lot of is nuts. We'll go into some of those. They are vegetarians primarily. They eat no meat. They eat frequent servings of nuts, and now the American Heart Association is, has found in, in 2003 that they recommend from 1.5 to 2 ounces of nuts a day. These people eat more than that usually, but anyhow, at least that. Now, these people avoid alcohol. They eat an early dinner and focus on the Sabbath every week when they devote time to their faith and family. They live in community. They do lots of things that we don't do. One, their Sabbath worship is the center of their life. And age is, prefer, I mean, is uh, appreciated. The oldest person in the family is the most important person in the family. Now that's present in all four of these blue zones. They honor their elders. They don't stick them in storage houses we call nursing homes. They take care of them themselves. Mm. Now, I realize in the economy, the way it is, that many times both members of the family have to work. Or they might not have the newest whistles and et cetera on gifts that they might want. Okay, Blue Soons continued. In Sardinia, Tony Tola is 86. He's a shepherd but drinks wine mid-morning and mid-afternoon, and again with his friends at night. Now, he does not drink wine to intoxication. They drink it as a means of fellowship. His work ethic and love of family and the fact that he is profoundly religious contribute to his longevity. Wine to them is a fellowship food, not an alcoholic drink. Now, in Okinawa... Ushe is 104. She wakes up every morning at 6 a.m., drinks miso soup, which is a vegetable soup, and green tea, spends two or three hours in the garden to reduce stress, eats lunch with her children and grandchildren, takes a nap, and at 5, she sits around with lifelong friends and drinks sake. That's rice wine. Now, this is a routine thing. They laugh, they joke, they enjoy life. And all these people are living in groups of from 98 to 110. She herself is 104 and digs her garden, is very active, takes walks. She eats a light dinner at night. Most of these people, now the Seventh-day Advents in general, eat a heavy breakfast. And that's the biggest calorie input all day. Because it makes sense they're getting ready for the day. Now... In Sardinia, Okinawa, and Costa Rica, they usually eat the biggest meal at noon. But all of them have the lightest meal in the evening. The lightest meal in the evening. What significance okay. does that have? What? Well, what's the significance of um, having a light meal in the evening? The light meal in the evening, they feel, it causes you, one, not to sleep as well, and two, your digestion slows down when you're asleep. So, in Nokoya, Panchita is 102. She has woken up at 4 a.m. most of her life and has a great longevity diet consisting of tortillas. She makes them every day. She grinds the corn and makes the tortillas, tortillas, and, tortillas and beans. Her son, Tommy, who's 80 years old, comes to see her every morning at 7 a.m. 
on his bicycle. And they celebrate together. And in Loma Melinda, California, Marge Jetton is 102. She was married for almost 75 years. When her husband died, she went into mourning, but then decided to do something in the way of volunteer work for 70-year-olds. She calls them old folks. The point here is the power of purpose. We think we can associate with a decade of good life. Power of purpose. Now, when we put people in one of these storage homes for people, they don't have any purpose. They don't have much interaction. You don't see a lot of people visiting. I used to go to 12 of them when I was in active practice here because it broke my heart to see all these people that would just be starved for somebody to talk to. At one time, I took care of the oldest person in the state of Kansas. She was 107. And do you know what she ate? She ate only one food. She ate post toasties three times a day <laughs> with skim milk. And that was her diet. She didn't want anything else. She didn't need anything else. And I figured if she got to be 107 eating post toasties, the only comment I could make is, I want to go to the store and buy her a couple boxes. <laughs> Anyhow, that was, now another thing in Loma Linda, this is interesting, they have a 95-year-old physician there, and he's a heart surgeon, and he's actively doing coronary artery bypasses as we speak. Oh, really? 95 years old, and uh, Dr. Oz, I don't know where you've heard of him. Yes. He's back in New Jersey. He's a surgeon. And he went out to scrub with him to make sure that he was doing the procedure. And he should, was shown he was doing them. He does them five days a week. Why can he do it at 95? He's living right, folks. He's got it together. He's doing what I'm trying to teach tonight. I've seen a movie of him doing surgery. Now, core practice of people who live the longest. They move naturally. Think they, uh, about walking. Think about it. Walking, gardening, and playing with your children and grandchildren to ensure daily activity. Be active is a summary of what I said. Set your environment so you are always bumping into the opportunity to move around. Use the stairs. Don't use the rem uh, elevators. Don't use the escalator. Use the stairs. Don't use the remote on your TV. Take your remote and pitch it. So you have to get up and go turn your TV on and change the channels. Take nature walks. One of the things they do in Loma Linda extensively is take nature walks, and they all get together and take pictures and discuss. They enjoy birds and flowers, and they enjoy life, folks, and they photograph it. Well, and they do it together. Here's a picture of a good walking trail like people use. Focus on having the right outlook. Know your sense of purpose. Schedule in times when you can downshift or take a break. Smell the flowers. You only pass this way once. Smell the flowers. Let me tell you. Of all the old people that I took care of, and one time I took care of five people over 95, and two of them were over 100. One was 102, one was 103. And you know the only regret those people have? They didn't take enough time off. They took time off, but they didn't take enough because they see they missed a lot. And one of the real saddest things, I went to Africa once. I've been in 37 countries, and I went to Africa. And when I got back, a patient of mine who was a multi multi millionaire, and he said, you know, I envy you going to Africa and seeing the animals. And I said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. Let me be home for four months, and if you'll pay my round-trip ticket and for my meals, my expenses, I'll go with you and make sure you're healthy enough to enjoy Africa. Oh, he said, I couldn't spend that much money. No. His grandkids went through his money, zip. And uh, it's a sad tale. But it's where we put our priorities, folks, and that's why this whole presentation is Quest for Longevity. It, I'm pleading with you to smell the flowers. Go for nature walks, like the Peekable in Loma Linda. 
Forget diets. Diets rarely work after six months. Dan Bootner, author of the book The Blue Zones, says instead, the key to staying slim and living longer, I'm quoting him, is eating wisely. He re recommends a plant-based diet that minimizes, but don't eliminate, meat. Eating fewer calories and consuming a glass or two of red wine per day, preferably mid-morning and mid-afternoon. Now, I presented this in the church that I go to, and I have people, several of them, come up to me later and said, there's no way that we can go into a, a uh, liquor store and buy some red wine. Well, I said, there's some of the drug stores have it, and there's a few of our grocery stores have it. But so far, there's been a big block among a lot of people. Well, if you look at it as a medication for a long life, and you're not going to empty the bottle, well, you know, because if you empty the bottle, you may get in your car and kill yourself that afternoon. So I'm not talking about an alcoholic intake. I'm talking about health here. Okay, connect the right way. Investing in your family is a huge point. In all blue zones in the world, people put their loved ones first. We think that is associated with more good years of life. They enjoy their family. They enjoy their grandkids, their great-grandkids. And that's just where it's at, folks, because that will keep you younger. Younger people keep you younger. You start to relating with who you spend your time with. Reconnect with religion is another thing they all do. People who go to church live two to three years longer than people who don't. That's been proven. Do you know that somewhere around 78% of people that buy a home in a new town always ask if there's a church in that town, if it's a small town. But on the other hand, 75% of them never go in it. And they look upon the church as being an evidence of it being safer. Mm. But these people in general haven't been in, entering in. People that pray regularly live three years longer than those who don't. Now there is a good six more years of life. Create your own culture of longevity. Pick out friends who have healthy lifestyles and put more energy into those friendships. You become like those you associate with. Now, here's something that I put in this. Patios have decreased closeness of neighbors. No longer do neighbors visit between front porches where close relationships developed. Well, I was raised on a farm, and our relationship with neighbors is they'd come visit us no warning, no notice, and we were joy, joyful to see him. Now, my wife's mother and father told me that they used to visit over their front porches. But now, when we're in our patios, most people are too far away to do much visiting. Or we're engrossed in activities that downplays visiting. Okay? So the front porches cause more relationships between fellow people that you associated with. Relationships with God and mankind is very healthy and promotes longevity. Now, in the book, The Blue Zones, by Kutner, and I'm going to show you the, the uh, credit for that, he has a brief introduction to the nine behaviors we believe can lead to longer living longer. And I'm going to go through some of those, but uh, there's one thing that I did want to do, and that was mention some of the things that uh, people eat in these blue zones, which I kind of thought uh, was a little bit interesting in uh, the areas where, uh, like in uh, Nicoya, Sardinia, Okinawa, and those areas, it's kind of interesting. Traditional people in Sardinia, Nicoyan, and Okinawans, they produce large gardens. And they supplement their stable food. In Sardinia, most of their food is made with durum wheat, which is hard wheat. And there's less carbohydrates in that wheat. It's hard and slow to digest, so your liver can handle the carbohydrate load. In Okinawa, it's kind of interesting. Okinawans were about to starve to death a few years ago, 
this is many years ago, and there, there were some Chinese that brought them a new plant to grow, and lo and behold, they found out that it grows everywhere, and now it's grown all over Okinawa, wild, and everybody has their own supply if they have any land, and it's called sweet potatoes. And they eat sweet potatoes three times a day in general in Okinawa. Now in Nicoya, they eat maize, or we call it corn, ground themselves by stones, and these people make their own tortillas every morning fresh. And the di difference in the Seventh-day Adventists is they don't eat any meat. And now, back to the nine secrets here. Number one, move. Low impact to moderate exercise. Find ways to move mindlessly. Make moving unavoidable. Now, you should have, ideally, 20 minutes of uninterrupted walking. And I used to tell my patients, you need, if you do 20 minutes of brisk, uninterrupted walking each day, it's better than jogging. It's less trauma to your body, your joints. So low impact to moderate exercise. And as you get older, you don't need as much. Ideally, 30 minutes to 60 minutes, five times a week. Now, number two, and it's called in Costa Rica, Plan de Vida, the plan of life. Know your purpose in life. What is your purpose? Why are you here? If you know why you're here and know what your purpose is, you're going to live seven years longer right there in that number two and alone. Number three, downshift. Work less. Take a break. You know, it's been shown if you take a break, just for example, studying in a university, if you take a break every 10 minutes, you increase your productivity. You wouldn't think you would because you lose 10 minutes but you increase it because you refresh your brain. So, slow down, smell the flowers, rest, take a vacation. You know, I used to have a friend who was a physician in western Kansas, and I went up to visit him one time, and I ate lunch with him. Well, not very much of the lunch I ate with him because he was done in five minutes. And he ate like a gorilla that hadn't eaten in three months. <laughs> He was stuffing food with both hands. And I said, what on earth are you doing? I knew him in med school, and he was a very nice guy. He said, Norm, if you work hard enough at it, you can learn to eat in five minutes. And so I can save that time for my practice. Oh, wow. Well, he died three years after that, and so he didn't save much for his practice. Mm -hmm. I never will forget him. And I never saw him after that because he didn't have time to visit. Okay. Mm -hmm. Town shift, work class, four, 80% rule. Now you see this in Okinawa, and they call it Hare Hachibu. Hare Hachibu means stop eating when you're 80% full. You see, here's the difference. In the people in the four blue zones, stop eating when they lose their hunger. In the U.S. and all the other places that don't have blue zones, in general, eat until they're full. There's a 20-minute lag on the time that the PYY peptides from your intestines shut down your appetite or your leptins in your intestines secreted shut down your appetite. There's 20 minutes lag, and that 20 minutes is where we get our obesity. That's where our obesity comes in. Remember, hari hachi boo. Stop when you lose your hunger. Stop when you're 80% full. Five, plant power. Eat more veggies, fresher the better, less protein, and no processed food if you can get along without it. What is processed food? It's everything that comes in a box. Everything that comes in a box is processed or plastic. Now, you eat as much food as you can in its natural surroundings. Grow a garden. Let your vegetables ripen. You get all kinds of nutrition. These are called glyconutrients or plant nutrition or polyphenols that you get in those fresh, fine ripened veggies. If you can't, well, you can go to farmer's markets 
And some of those are now picking green and then letting them ripe. But you can uh, find out, and you can tell by looking at tomatoes. If tomatoes don't have cracks in them, they're not vine ripened, OK? Where they burst open a little bit. Those cracks are important. Mm. OK, number six, red wine. Consistency and moderation. Now, for your future study, resveratrol is the chemical that's in red wine along with some alcohol. And I myself uh, have read lots and lots of literature on resveratrol. I think that that's going to be something that if we won't drink white wine, we should take. And uh, it's going to be available. The government is going to have it out, uh, I know, in about seven years. But there is quite a few uh, areas where you can get it as a supplement, resveratrol. Seven, belong to a social network. Create a healthy social network. You know, if you spend your time around people that eat anything in sight, or what I call seafood, everything they see they want to eat, um, that isn't going to help your health. Spend your time with people that want to be healthy and live in a healthy environment. Eat off the veggie tray. Eat off the veggie counter. You know, that's that's important. You need all of, a lot of reds and a lot of greens in your diet. Reds, you're going to get lutein. And polyphenols are in all of those. And eat some nuts. OK? Eight, beliefs. Perk up your spiritual life, your religious participation. Be a member of a church if you possibly can. If you live too far from a church, you're too far to live. Now, I'm talking about community. Get in a church where you can be one of a group of people. It's been proven. And every one of these four blue zones have that as a big item. These nine things were done by National Geographic Survey. And these are the things that all of them shown. Number nine, you may have some trouble with, your tribe. It means all of your relatives. Make a family, make family a priority. Enjoy your grandkids. Enjoy your great-grandkids. After all, they should be going home when you're tired out and not living with you all the time. But if they do, be sure your mother and fathers are living with you too, because that's important. Increase your family connections. The more you do with your family, the more it nourishes you. And it nurtures you in a great way. Now, let's go to the next slide. I, this is a little pyramid. And as you can see, all nine of these are here. You see this one with hands around a circle down the bottom tier? That's the family. That's the community. And each one of those stands for something that's in all of those nine things I just showed you. Walk. There's a wine glass there. There's the longevity pyramid. OK? Now, I want to acknowledge at this time the source of all these materials I've used regarding the blue zones. I have got material from Andrew Weil on his the uh, aging, healthy aging, and Barry Sears, the anti-aging zone, and Dr. Dan Butner. Oh, he isn't a doctor. He may have a PhD, but Dan Butner, B-U-E-T-T-N-E-R. The information on the blue zones is from his book, The Blue Zones, which I'd recommend everybody listening to me to get and read. The Blue Zones by Dan Butner. It was published by National Geographic in 2008. I got one for Christmas this last year. I would encourage anyone that has an interest in living longer to get and read a copy of this book. But don't have the attitude about living longer that Mark Twain had. Somebody asked him, because he was an avid cigar smoker, asked him, uh, do you think that if you quit smoking, you'll live longer? He puffed a couple of times and said, I don't know, but it sure seemed longer. Now, 
don't get in that mode because what you're after is to find out things that will encourage you and ex extend your life. And uh, there's many things. I haven't mentioned much about the nuts, but the nuts are important. And uh, uh, I would encourage you to have them. You know, whole grains and things of that nature are very important. A lot of those are anti-cancer. Uh, be sure you have insoluble fiber. That will reduce cholesterol, help your clotting mechanism. And, you know, it's just uh, those things that really will count. The best nuts to eat, are you ready for this? The best nuts are almonds, peanuts, pecans, pistachios, hazelnuts, and walnuts, and some pine nuts if you can get them. Now, Brazil nuts, cashews, and macadamias have a little more saturated fat, and uh, a lot of medical circles think they're less desirable. How, however, macadamias have omega-3s in them, so you know that's good for you, okay? Now, those are just some of the add-on things that I did want to, uh, to tell you about. I'm constantly studying this, so there's things that I come up that uh, I don't mention. Now, another thing to do is go to www.bluezones.com, and on there, Dan Bootner has a interview test that you all should take. It's called Vitality Compass. You do your Vitality Compass. Now, the reason I'm promoting it, I want to tell you, I took mine and it said 98 years. Well, I don't know whether that's accurate or not, but I'm just telling you, it gives you a lift to make you think you're better. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's sure positive. Uh, and those are the things that, that I would do. One to half to two ounces of these nuts per day. Now, my cardiologist told me to eat a handful. I guess he looked at my hand, and I think my hand will, I love nuts, I think it'll hold more than two ounces. But my last slide here is from Proverbs 24, 13, and 14, tells us, my child, eat honey, for it is good, and the honeycomb is sweet to the taste. In the same way, wisdom is sweet to the soul. Now, you can't eat too much honey, and that's in the Bible, too. So don't overdo it. I had some patients when I was in practice that, that said, well, I'm diabetic. I can eat all the honey I want. That's not true. It'll raise your blood sugar. But the point down below that is how much honey and wisdom have you eaten today? And that concludes my slideshow. But, uh, David, uh, maybe we have some questions. Well, absolutely. Thank, thank you, Dr. Marvin. Um, if, if maybe you could leave that last slide on. So at least we can have something to look at. Oh, well, I've got the, oh, let me put the first one on. Okay, that's, that's good, too. And How's that? And, my, and by the way, way, that's not a picture of me on that bicycle. <laughs> I got more hair than that. You got more hair than that. Okay, got it. <laughs> <laughs> so does, do you want to open up for some questions, David? Well, absolutely. Uh, folks, there's a, if you're new here, there's a blue panel to the right of your screen, and you can type in questions. Uh, we already have a few here, but if you have, if you have any more questions, um, go ahead and type it in. Uh, I'll be here reading them out. Someone asks, is uh, pure natural grape juice as beneficial as red wine? No. And I thought that would be an easy way out. No, it isn't. And, they, and one of the reasons why researchers say it isn't is because there is some alcohol. And the alcohol has been shown in small amounts. Now, I'm talking when I say a glass mid-morning, a glass in the afternoon. These are small glasses. These aren't tumblers mm -hmm. of wine. These are juice glasses of wine mid-morning, mid-afternoon. But they claim that the, and I've got that in research somewhere here, that the content of alcohol is a benefit. They studied what that. What is that? Well, is that the reservatrol you mentioned? No, reservatrol is in the grape juice. But I just reviewed a research this afternoon 
that says that you would have to drink about 1,000 bottles of wine a day to equal 500 milligrams of resveratrol, or resveratrol. Resveratrol is the topic. And if you, to 500 milligrams, they give twice a day. So I don't think anybody's going to drink that much wine. So you're not going to get this much resveratrol. But until we can get ample resveratrol, and it's coming up, it's, uh, I take some right now myself, not that much because I couldn't get that much, but I take some resveratrol right now. Mm. So grape juice is not as good as wine. Okay. So is the alcoholic, are you saying is the alcoholic content of the red wine that is the beneficial part? There's a part, yes. It's part of the beneficiality of the wine. Okay. Uh, what do you think about vitamin D? She just left it open there, I guess. I think vitamin D is one of the m least appreciated vitamins there is. I have about 45 research papers on the efficacy of vitamin D. I myself take vitamin D twice a day. And I take it every day because it is that important. And uh, I would take at least 300 milligrams twice a day. Now let me tell you something about vitamin D. Those that are interested in it and those that aren't can listen anyhow. Okay? And vitamin D, I take, and this I'm looking at my contents, about 2,000 units of vitamin D twice a day. But there's a research done recently at the University of Kansas School of Medicine on osteoporosis, which is one of the causes of untimely death. When we have a fractured hip, 30% of the people with a, actually 33 and a third percent of the people with a fractured hip won't live a year. Now, that's harsh statistics, but that's what the latest is. And most of the time, we don't fall and break our hip. We break our hip due to osteoporosis and fall. Because you can't stand when you've got a neck of the femur broken. Now, I, did, I went to this. I still go to medical meetings. I love to go to medical meetings. And uh, this uh, doctor at the University of Kansas specializes in osteoporosis. And he tested all kinds of vitamin D. And he said the best insurance of vitamin D and calcium that you can take in your body is caltrate. Caltrate. It's the cheapest and as good as anything tested, including pure hormone. So I recommend to people to take caltrate. You can get it at Costco. You can get it at Sam's Cheap. You can get it at Walmart. You can get it at most all big drugstores. You take one in the morning, one in the evening, and that's it. you got all the calcium you need, along with your vitamin D. Yes, the answer to vitamin D is very, very, very important. It's been understated and underemphasized, and we all should be on some. Unless we're going around in the sun most of the time. Now, at where I live, it'd be just a hair chilly to go out in the sun with your shirt off. Mm -hmm. really they cold put you in a funny farm in about five minutes <laughs> at nine above zero or something. I mean, they'd have you in a blanket headed toward the uh, funny farm. Anyhow, uh, any other questions? What is your opinion of supplementing with L-arginine to help clean arteries and prevent heart attacks? Have you studied that? Yes, I think L-arginine is excellent. Mm -hmm. I think it's very good. It's been proven. has a lot of research behind it. And uh, I try, I'm not on L-Arginine right now because I'm using uh, this resveratrol. And uh, I do take it occasionally. And so I think it's very good for people to prevent uh, their risk for heart attacks. We actually have um, a doctor who came to do a presentation on L-Arginine. It's actually won a Nobel Prize. Uh, the, 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 discovery that L-arginine can have such beneficial effects on your cardiovascular system. So the person who asked this question, if you would, uh, if you want to know more about it, you can go to our website. Uh, I think it's called Saving the Human Heart. You can find and is that on your website? 
Yes, the MP3s and the handouts are on my web on the website. Well, why'd you like to get a hold of that? Oh, well, Dr. Marvin, all you need to do is ask. <laughs> okay, I'm asked. <laughs> okay, you got it. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I'm really a fan of L-Arginine. I didn't know you had it on a program. Well, he did an excellent job. He did, an ex he did a very, very good job, and he was really, he covered a lot of good, good stuff. Okay. What do you, do, uh, I'll send it to you after the webinar. Do you think we can get the glyconutrients we need from the gardens we grow? <laughs> well, it depends on how big your garden and how much you can live through the winter. You see, that's going to be your problem. You, you've got to have fresh, fine ripened fruits and veggies, and you're not getting them at the grocery store. Mm -hmm. We see too much green harvesting. And I could go into that in detail. But what they do is they pick most things 10 to 12 days before their vine ripen. They're green, hard as rocks, green as gourds. And they put them in a big plastic sack. And I've got this from the San Joaquin Valley. So I've got it verified by the people who sell it. They put all the green, say for example, tomatoes in those plastic bags, fill it with, with ethylene gas, in four hours, they're all bright red. They ship them to Kansas City. They're still rock-hard, gourd green. But the time they get to Kansas City, they put them out on the shelf, and they're all beautiful shaped in the same shape. Here's the thing. Look for them. If you don't see cracks on those tomatoes, they don't have glyconutrients in them. If you don't see bugs bites on them, don't eat them. Because if the bugs won't bite them, you shouldn't. Mm. You should be as smart as a bug when you're looking at uh, fresh fruits and veggies. Uh, no, I don't think you can get all of them unless, you know, you live somewhere where you've got them. You might want to move to Costa Rica and have your own garden there because I think probably you can have uh, a, a good part of them. I doubt it because you're going to have to have some yams to make up for the, uh, you know, the different procedures that support your hormone system, your phytosterols, and uh, you got to look for those. So, no, I don't think you can get all of them you need, personally. But that's for another time. Right. I don't think you can either. All right, here's a question. If you work in the aged care home, I guess it means the nursing home, taking care of old folk, will it affect your health, as most of them are inactive and moody? You what? He says most of them, because most of them are inactive and moody, that that's, I think he, what he's saying is that that can affect someone else, the person taking care of them and the person too. Well, I got an answer for that person. You either raise the patient's mood or they're going to lower your mood. Right. So be proactive. Go in there and talk to them, visit with them, share, laugh with them, perk them up by showing life, and then they'll show you life. Uh, that's the whole sad circumstances in nursing homes. You know, don't be afraid to go in there. There's too many people already afraid to go in there. Aging isn't contagious. Mm -hmm. You know, what I've always told people is life is a terminal illness, and it's sexually transmitted. You think about that for a minute. So... It's a terminal illness. We're all going to die. And what you need to do, go in there and share an upbeat, happy life and form a relationship with those people, and they will respond back. If you're grumpy to them, they're going to be grumpy back. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what you're going to be. Right. Well, they sure appreciate it. I, I live in, <laughs> I tell people that a lot. I live in a retirement home for about three and a half years, and when people ask me that, and they, they hear that I lived in a retirement home, and uh, usually my, my my usual answer to them is, well, the reason, well, you, you know what, we we black people age a lot better than you white people do, so <laughs> I may not look that old. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, but anyway, um, we had, I mean, we the people that love to have. Just the, what you talked about, they, they, they loved company. They wanted to, every time they saw me, uh, I, I, every time I went visiting, they would just be so happy uh, to have someone to talk to. 
And um, I, I, like you said, I think that's, that plays a, a, a huge role in longevity and health, and just that social connection. Ask them about their life, and they'll spell it all out for you. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I was uh, in I all these nursing homes in Kansas City, and one of them had one wing that most of the people in there had been in prisoner of war camps in Germany, in Auschwitz, in Pinamundi, all those places. And you know what? I had to tear myself away from there because I loved to visit with those people and talk to them. But I had to get on with my business, but I made it a point of visiting with those people. They had a lot of things to share and a lot of admonition to warn people about that we probably should be listening to today. Mm -hmm. But they've got a lot of things. We should, we should appreciate our aged people. Because they've got wisdom, whether we think they do or not. Somebody got all kind of garbage called the age difference. Well, they're from a different age. There's an aging gap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the problem, the aging gap. If the young people listen to the older people who've been through a lot of hard knocks, they benefit. I used to listen to my granddad by the hour. Probably didn't listen enough. And he had a lot of wisdom. Both my granddads did. One of them was a cowboy and the other one was a farmer. So, yeah, go in there. I think everybody listened to me ought to visit a nursing home once a week and just go in and talk to those people. It'll make them feel better. You've done something other people appreciate. Mm -hmm. Go in and read the Bible to them. Read a psalm to them. Go in and interact with them. They appreciate it. I'll never forget the dumbest thing I've ever seen in the nursing home. I walked into one of the nursing homes I went to, one of the 12, and there were people vomiting on the floor in, in wheelchairs and screaming, some of them fainting, passed out, vomiting on their clothes. And so I said, what on earth happened here? The nurse says, well, the activity chairman called and had an animal expert come, and he brought a boa constrictor and would have everybody pet it. And it caused chaos, scared those people to death. Some of them saw snakes when they weren't any snakes. Now they had one that didn't know whether it was real or not. Oh, so God. don't do stuff like that. That's stupid. They didn't help anybody there, and it was an awful mess to clean up. Mm. So that's what not to do. Got it. So I want to ask what, what type of water is good for us to drink. Reversed osmosis water. Now, there is other waters, like clustered water. In clustered water, you have to go to a place called wellnessfilter.com. And that has a filter that you can get wellness water. That's excellent. I have a uh, under-the-sink wellness water filter, but my filter is plugged up, and I can't use it anymore. And I've not got nerve enough to get in there and and try to be a plumber, because uh, I've tried that in my old age, and my age is state of wisdom enough to stay away from that. So anyhow, uh, wellnessfilter.com is how you can get clustered water, which goes into your cells very rapidly. However, if you haven't got anything else, be sure you're using reversed osmosis water. And don't drink, in my opinion, don't drink out of those thin plastic bottles. If you want to prove that, take one of those bottles of water that everybody's sucking on nowadays, and one that's, that's flexible, and set it on, a, on your sink, and dump it a couple times a day. Just fill it with water and dump it after about eight hours, and then fill it and dump it again. In about five days, it won't even stand up. Well, what happened? That plastic was dissolved in the water, and it's going in your body. And that's one of the things that your body doesn't handle well, is plastic. So if you want to drink bottled water, make sure you've got a stiff bottle that won't dissolve, or glass. And uh, that's your safest. That's the good water. But at least use reverse osmosis water. We also had someone on our webinar who talked about um, oxygenated water. Right. They had a, a website called, I think it's rainforest.com. I can give you about 15 different types of water. Everybody's water is the best in the world. Mm -hmm. But I'm not convinced that uh, which ones are totally the best. There's Camgen water. There's oxygen water. 
oxyl. There's all kinds of waters. But, uh, you know, it, read them over, see the validity. The Camgen, you can change the pH from base to acid, and that's great. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's what you should have. You need to have your, your water a little basic, and everybody will tell you that. So look into that and see which one's the best. Be proactive. Look at these things. What, what do you think about uh, acai juice and also Minute Maid, pomegranates, and blueberry juice? Well, I'd rather have blueberries than blueberry juice because you get more of the quality. Right. And I love blueberries. I'll eat them with a handful. And they're loaded with antioxidants. They're very, very good. Pomegranate juice, well, I think it's fine. It's better than some juices. I'd always check the sugar content because to make them sell better, a lot of companies dump sugar in them, and they reverses the benefit. There's hundreds of juices out there claiming everything from taking warts off your nose to making you a genius, and I'm not sure that many of that works. But in general, fresh juice has antioxidants and it has polyphenols. Look at the contents. If you get them at a place like Whole Foods, look at the contents and see if they got polyphenols or glyconutrients or any of those qualities that are good. And uh, that's what I'd use. And, you know, if you can, remember, here's the dictum. Eat your food as much as the way God made it. It's the healthiest for you. In other words, if you can eat blueberries, don't drink your juice because it's stronger, got more fiber, got more of every quality in it than the juice. And... You know, I don't know why I wouldn't drink the juice myself. I'd get the blueberries. We've got a big berry patch here that you can get blueberries by the bucket. And they're wonderful. Most all foods, the fresher they are in the natural state, the better. I want to ask you, which one is better, reverse osmosis or clotted, clotted wellness water? It's hard to tell which is not On the wellness water? Yeah, clustered, clustered, yeah, wellness, clustered water. wellness water. I myself water. would prefer the clustered wellness water, and you get that at wellnessfilter.com. Now, you can get the carafe, which is a pitcher, which would I recommend, or if you want to get under the sink, you can get under the sink. And you can get all those different attachments at that website. Okay. And the, the web website, again, is uh, wellnessfilter.com? The wellnessfilter.com. And uh, you can get the carafe. That's a pitcher. I have a friend that bought two pitchers, one she travels with, and the other one she has at home. I myself have this under-sink uh, wellness filter. And then I have one I've never got installed, which is a uh, uh, shower filter. And uh, you haven't seen how water is in the shower, they tell me to use that wellness filter shower. Another thing you can do with wellness clustered water is very good, is you can take, say, go down and buy some celery. Put it in a glass flat vessel, in, you know, in stalks of it, and then fill that and cover it with wellness water and leave it overnight. You'll think you've got fresh celery because it goes right into the product. It goes in through the cells, just like it will in your cells. And so uh, a lot of people use that for their fruits and vegetables. They wash all the uh, contaminants off the outside of them first, and then they put them in wellness water, and it really invigorates them. Can't 15 minutes of sunshine be in place of vitamin D? You get about 50,000 units around noon, and the closer you are to the equator, the more you get, laying out in the sun. Now, I'd say that would be with shorts on and, uh, you know, most of your skin exposed. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's great, but I don't know many people in my climate that can do that. Mm -hmm. You know, some of you might, 
then you might increase your melanoma scare because uh, the sunshine on your skin, your squamous cell carcinoma rate is going up, your basal cell carcinoma rate is going up of sunshine. So why fight it? If you you know if you don't want to have those lovely experiences of melanomas and basal cell carcinomas and squamous cell, and I have nothing against sunshine, but let me tell you, sunshine increases aging of your skin. You won't be as old, but your skin will be. I once did a medical uh, CME, continuing medical education, in Cancun. Well, that is near the equator. I got so scorched, I couldn't even sleep at night, and I had cool breeze blowing on me all day. And uh, I didn't realize how cold it was. But the first day of that course, uh, David, they put a picture of a woman on the screen and told all of us to write on a piece of paper how old we thought she was. I put 84 because she was wrinkled. I mean, her face had creases in it, about like mine is now. I mean, she was really leathered, her face was. When we all had, and no one put her below 75, she was 40. Oh, and her aging face was due to too much sunshine. So there's the downside. And I'm all, you can go out and get as much sunshine as you want, but you better not try to get all your vitamin D that way. You're not going to get much work done if, unless you can do your work in shorts out in the sun. Right. You know what I mean? Nothing against it, but it's just not as convenient. If we were out hunter gatherers picking our veggies and our food, we could do it. I guess there's, uh, I think, something to be said for, for balance and understanding when to go out and how, how long to stay out and when to come back. Yeah, I wouldn't stay out over 15 minutes if you've got a lot of your body exposed that isn't tanned. Mm -hmm. I know 15 minutes will give you 50,000 units. Well, that's pretty good, you know. And 50,000 units, my pills uh, is only 2,000 units, and I take two of them a day, that's 4,000 units. And uh, you can get 50,000 units in 15 minutes, and if you can do it, but you got to have some skin out there. You don't go out with your shirt on. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right, right. And if you want to uh, have some fruits and veggies uh, fresh, in your hand and walk out, take your shirt off. Now, downtown Kansas City, you would probably stand out like a sore thumb, but uh, if you can do it in your backyard or someplace else, fine. I have nothing against it. You can get your vitamin D. And the vitamin D3 is the most, rec is the most recommended one over? Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. Great. Caltrate okay. is so simple, so easy. Now, I take Caltrate plus more D3. You know, I take Caltrate for calcium. Here's one thing I didn't get to share with you. One of the things they think that makes the Nicoians and uh, Costa Rica, Nicoians in Costa Rica, live longer is their water is loaded with calcium. Mm. So they have a high calcium diet every day. And, you know, these people live out on a peninsula, the Nicoyan Peninsula. And uh, they don't have any water softeners or anything like that. And uh, the only downside to that is they're eating enough calcium, they're living to be 110. Hmm. You see, you know, some wise person said, it's not everybody that's old is going to have a lot of, a lot of wisdom about everything. Because everybody, when they get old, has a lot of knowledge that ain't so. And a lot of knowledge that ain't so isn't productive. But there's a lot of knowledge that is that an older person has, and that's what you've got to eat the fish and spit out the bones, so to that's speak. Right. That's right. I agree. Well, folks, we have been treated to some tremendous amount of wisdom concerning age and wellness and longevity. And uh, I guess this kind of wraps it up. Dr. Marvin, do you have anything else you want to leave us with? No, not much, except 
you know, just remember, if you want to follow these things, you're going to put more life in your years than years in your life. And think about that lady, the 110, with her kids around her all the time. Mm -hmm. Think about, you know, the heart surgeon at 95 still doing coronary artery bypasses. I've had all kinds of doctors say, well, it's impossible. Well, the way we live here, it is impossible. <laughs> the way they live there, it isn't. Right. You know? They have people in all these four areas that are doing manual labor at 100. And remember, I said I have a National Geographic picture here at arm's reach of a 130-year-old woman. Who enjoys life and laughing the storm up. We need to laugh more. Laugh as yeah. much as you can, because it's a really healthy thing. Well, you mentioned Loma Linda. There's a, there's a professor there called Lee Brook who has made a career out of studying laughter and what it can, the benefits yes. it, it can do on your health. Loma Linda has some great science that has been poo-pooed by too much of the medical profession. Mm. They have their own grocery store. You ought to see what they have. They have bulk nuts. They have... They get sacks of those nuts and take with them and eat them, and they eat them consistently. And that has been proven to increase your lifespan. Mm. Gosh, there's so much to know. Yes. I'm, I'm well, young, I'm young. you know, I'd recommend that people interested would uh, get that book, The Blue Zones. Mm. And the website is updated all the time. And uh, there's a lot of people involved. And so you can learn a lot. Take that, the vitality compass. Everybody should take that. Go to the blue zones and take the compass. You, you heard him, folks. Go to the blue zones and take the vitality compass. <laughs> All right, well. Uh, I think you know everything I have. I'm going to have to be led to bed because I won't know what to go. I have a bit of information. My head is yours. Well, uh, you, you, hopefully you're going to ref refresh and replenish that information because in about a month's time we, we're going to need you back here. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much again, Dr. Marvin. We thank you, David, for allowing me to speak. Absolutely. Thank you. God hey, folks, bless. Uh, thank you. God bless you, sir. Folks, uh, um, see you on Thursday. Please be sure to tell your folks, your, your friends, your relatives, everybody who, who uh, may be using medications. And be sure to have the, invite them for the webinar on, on Thursday. And, of course, next week. And this month is really going to be a power-packed month. So please be sure to attend as many as you possibly can. The webinars are all free, like you know. God bless and have a great rest of the week. <laughs> Bye. Bye.